Welcome to Beyond the Clef. I am here with Matt Porter, and he is the director at Tompkins High School. Today we're going to be talking about the positive atmospheres that he tries to uh, perpetuate in his programs. We're going to be talking about some collaboration that he does with uh, the dance department and other departments in his school, uh, some of the relationships with his feeders, and a couple uh, tidbits of advice for the young budding orchestra directors or general teachers out there. So that's coming up next on Beyond the Clef. Beyond the Clef is presented by Director's Choice. Well, right. Matt, thank you so much for being on the program. Uh, you're at SMSE 2019, yeah. and I can't believe we're already here uh, when we're filming this. Uh, so welcome. Well, thank thanks so for having me. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you are the director of orchestra at Tompkins High School. Right. Okay. And yes. tell, tell our audience where Tompkins is. So Tompkins is in KDISD, which okay. is a suburb of Houston uh, to the west. Right. And okay. uh, it's just this massive, what has become a massive district now. It we, is. We have, I think, uh, not this year, but next school year, we'll be opening our ninth, what I think is our ninth 6A wow. high school. So That's a lot of high it schools. It is, yeah. That's a lot of high schools and a lot of orchestra programs. Yes. <laughs> yeah, a lot so of great all, orchestra programs. All so. of them have an orchestra. Yes. And so, right. and, and so you're one of those eight. Yeah. Right. And then um, how many feeders do you have? Well, currently, uh, I guess they just changed the feeder pattern for our, our area, and we're serving... I think we'll we we'll have four junior high feeders. One of which is my wife. One of our primary feeders is my wife. Oh, great, uh, Bree. So that's that's a lot of fun. But uh, we also have another school that that just opened that will kind of be helping out before the next high school opens, and they they head to that school. So kind of have five junior highs underneath us right now. That's a and lot. That's a lot more than degrees, I. Yeah. That is in my cluster now. How many um, kids are you serving in your school total so in our school I think we're around 3,500 kids okay. in our six so a small school, school right so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is why there's another high school sure <laughs> sure absolutely year after this year so. and just give us a picture how many kids are in your program uh, in our program we'll be approaching about 300 students oh, wow. in orchestra from wow. grades 9 through 12 okay. so tell me about your school and your orchestra program with uh, uh, you said you have about 300 kids. Now, how many orchestras do you have, and what's the structure? So, we're lucky enough to have orchestras pretty much throughout the the entire day. So we have six orchestras. I think uh, our our top level orchestras are more normal size. So we have about 30 kids in those upper level groups, and then our our entry level groups are more around 50 to 60 in each one of those groups. So. And I always have to ask, because this is a curious conversation, do you ever start orchestra students um, from new in high school? You know, when our school first opened, I had that thought, but uh, it just kind of ballooned so fast that it was it's, really hard to do. But It's hard to do the I, dedicate the resources to yeah, something like that. I, I've known several schools that have done that, and it's very interesting, especially right. for some of those, mu those kids that may have sort of missed the bus on music, and right. then they see how awesome it could be and how much fun their friends are having and they want to jump in too right. so I regret that we're just not able to do that but it's very right. interesting whenever I've done that in the past it, uh, it either works out really well or really poorly it's a kid <laughs> that comes in and that's the kid that drains the resources because they're in trouble or something uh, that, just my experience or it was the kid I, I'm thinking of somebody in, in uh, my past when I taught in Houston um, that that is they're now a uh, a director like they, they started their junior oh, wow. year and yeah. then now they're a, a musician yeah you and never so, know yeah it, it's it's either extreme it's, it's never it seems like it's right in the middle yeah. so that's just i just thought i'd i always like to ask people that so uh, with those 300 students you have to be concerned about the atmosphere like all large programs are and we were talking before uh, the interview about how you're really into having a positive atmosphere for the kids can you explain what you mean by that well <clears throat> On several, excuse me, several different levels, I think you can make a positive impact on kids. So I think one of the main ingredients for our success and having a really positive environment is our student leaders. So we actually have a pretty involved process, as you can imagine, with 300 kids and all the kids that are motivated to be a leader in that environment and, and how much they love music. That it's competitive and uh, we get a chance to be pretty selective with our student leaders so um, when we run them through the ringer and, and talk to them and run interviews we we get to see kind of and uh, and have the cream of the crop of those kids that, that help 
help us lead that program. So um, I think their impression on the students coming in, your freshmen and sophomore kids, is really important that they, uh, you're going to face adversity at some point, and you know, even in the best programs, you're going to have some challenges, and how do you face those challenges? And, and I always do my best to face it with a positive attitude. I'm sorry I touched my mic. And, no, that's okay. <laughs> uh, but also, you know, how do those student leaders respond to things? You know, do they overcome quickly? Do they help you lead other students and, and you know, put on the face of success, I guess you could say, and, and help proliferate that positive environment? Or are they, you know, are they doing other things? Are they talking about how the director said this one thing to them and it makes them really upset and then that sort of turns into a negative shadow that can can kind of keep growing if you're not careful so um, I'm also conscious of, of my relationships with other colleagues I think the, one of the most important things you could do is show kids by example that that you are a leader by just being the I guess the person in your school, if, it, if not everybody in your fine arts department, that, that knows how to work well with others. So um, we make a huge effort, I, I think, every year to try and do some collaboration. And uh, one of my favorite things is actually, uh, we have a pretty successful dance program at Tompkins High School. Um, and the, the people in dance are very, very involved. I'm sure you can, you can probably guess how much time they put in, you know, comparing to marching band. Marching band is sort of similar in a way. But uh, we did a collaboration with them where we uh, played some music and learned some choreography while these dancers, I guess the officer team, did their own dance. And I think that's one of my favorite memories is finding these uncommon ways where you can collaborate with colleagues and, and produce some stuff that, you know, quite honestly, People in the area will, will keep talking about, oh, you remember that one time that you did that thing? And, and That's really great with the community, too. Like, the, the community talks about it, and they talk about those things. Uh, and so, like, maybe someone who is not necessarily usually exposed to orchestra that's maybe a dance parent. Right. They're seeing what you're doing and then help can advocate yeah. in the community about the great things going on in, yeah. uh, in a different fine art area. And the unspoken thing that's happening is you're seeing the dance director... Um, highlight the orchestra program and say without saying this like orchestra is important you know let's branch out and be a part of that and so you have so many opportunities to do that with your band choir orchestra and uh, we've even done a little collaboration with our art program and as much as we can so the kids see that and they they value that and and you know we're talking about that the world is a collaborative environment and the teamwork that has to be done like tell them almost on a weekly basis that that this will go on to serve you well in life whether you continue with music or not you'll you're going to be in a job where you have to get along with other people and and sometimes that's easy and sometimes it's not so easy so yeah I've heard that in the future people are talking about our our jobs is that I hate to say the gig economy because I feel like that's not in vogue anymore, but that really is where we're getting towards is less, maybe 30 years from now, those professions that are just mobile professions and the people who are going to get ahead in those professions are the people that can collaborate with each other and work on projects very quickly and get along with people very quickly. And that's where I feel like music and our teamwork doing something so high level but with such teamwork with each other and collaborating with other areas, that's really great that you're doing that. Yeah. And... The, th- the thing I think I love the most about it is when you establish that environment and then you see your own kids, officers or students in your orchestra, uh, in their interactions with each other, they start employing the, you know, the get-along technique or the collaborative technique or learning how to, to give a little and, and all that. That's really inspiring. And, I think that makes me smile the most. So, yeah. Well, if we can talk about specifics, because you brought this up, it's kind of cool. The, so uh, this event that you did with dance, um, how do you go about collaborating with the dance department? And um, sometimes, like on my campus, we always say, like, head, heads of each program need to be talking to heads of each program So we, uh, because they're the visionary for that area. Right. So how do you approach the dance uh, department about that? How do you work with them? How do you plan it out? And, like, and where does it go when there's a conflict? 
Well, I think these these ideas are almost never original. I think we all, as, as directors, learn to beg, borrow, and steal from everybody. So um, in this case, I'd heard about it from another director in the district. And uh, so it's kind of churning in my brain. And uh, we sat down to have our big calendar meeting at the end of the, the year uh, to plan for the next year, which is always, you know, it can be a very tense environment as you're uh, trying to get pack dates and, right. and all of that. So uh, the opportunity arises. I mean, everybody's there. You could talk about collaboration the easiest there and, and throw an idea out on the table and see as you're planning the calendar. Because sometimes you, you know, you can, you can think you can handle more when it's really, really far away. Oh, yeah, we can do that. And that, that's your opportunity to jump in and just do it. Okay, well, we scheduled this thing. We, let's, get, let's put our heads together and, and make it happen as that date comes closer. So we threw that out on the table at the, the calendar meeting. And then as the, the date approached, we made contact and talked about music selection and the performance and choreography and, and the level involvement with the, with the kids and how many rehearsals and all of that. And, and what just, time of year did you do happen. this? So... Uh, I think it was towards the end of the year, which is can be a very, very busy right. time of year. Right. But I think if you plan anything far enough in advance and you know it's coming, almost anything is sure. possible. So. Sure. Yeah, what I tend to do is I always have my times of year when I'm like, oh, can't do anything at the time of year. That's a busy month. Uh, let me do January. January is usually pretty light. And what happens in January is <laughs> I've done that so much that I've blown up my January. That's right. So. Uh, yeah. Every time of year is always kind of a busy year, but yeah, the end of the year seems like it's that's a lot. That's a lot to do with so many, especially in high school, so many things pulling the kids every way. Yeah. 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 Well, let's go back to what we were talking about your positive atmosphere. Um, how do you set that up from the beginning of the year? What is is there something specific that you're or overt about at the beginning of the year, like first day of school kind of thing, or the first event that you have in the year to set the tone? So back to our student officers that we have. In fact, uh, I think next weekend is our our training session with our student officers we do a, a clinic usually with with dr tim uh i think most people know dr tim lots an hour and uh just amazing he he throws it to kids in a really uh upfront way how to be that that person that everyone looks up to and i think i value that almost more than any other logistical training or talking to the kids you know just how to maintain that attitude and and after we're, afterwards, uh, we sit down and we talk and we do a lot of planning and, and, uh, and then quite honestly encourage them to, to do this throughout the year. And, you know, they're not always going to feel as pumped up in the moment that they just had their Dr. Tim lecture throughout the year. So encourage them, you know, there's going to be some times where you're not feeling it. And, and, you know, those are the times that you probably have to power through the most. And when those freshmen are, are watching you the most and seeing how you handle stress and, and all the things going on, so. I always get to the point with my kids when, uh, I, I realized this a couple of years ago when I, I trained a group of kids coming in. Of course, I'm in a middle school, so really it's two years worth of kids because beginners don't really count. They're little post-elementary children, right, you know. Yeah. But with my, I had such a great group and then, um, the next couple of years in my back of my head is like, well, why are they not doing this? And I realized they're not going to train the next class necessarily, especially at such a young age in only two years. I have to do it. So it's like every year I have to work on leadership and continuing and, oh, and not get lax. It never on ends. I know. Yeah, yeah. 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 Because it's a new group of kids. Yeah, right. You know, yeah. you can't I just think, expect your kids to be good yeah, kids. That's the danger of becoming a veteran teacher is you forget you still have to teach these things yeah. So every yeah. single year. But uh, back to the, the kind of keeping that positive environment throughout the year. Um, I, you know, as much as you talk to the kids and take them to trainings, I think it's really important as directors that we maintain that positive attitude. And that's probably the number one challenge that we all face. I mean, we're all uh, musicians and know what needs to be done, but can you do it in a way that kids are still encouraged and feel excited about getting it done? And, and are you that type of director that they're that they are motivated to to keep pushing and keep trying to 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 go beyond their limits to to be the best they can be so you know it's really hard sometimes of course we all know we've had those moments where you just want to tear your hair out but but you know if you can maintain that calm and 
and you know let the kids that it's important to you without without turning it into a negative thing uh, I think you'll you'll never regret being overly kind even when it even when the stress is on so yeah yeah, yeah. It, it seems like that's the most important times when the stress is on uh, I tend to have that accidentally come out the beast comes out I get right. I get angry about this thing or you know one kid in my top group accidentally plays a wrong note and um, I, I just get on because we're two weeks before contest and they just made an accident but I get so intense and so into the moment that it's like that's not the way to handle it because right. it never solves yeah. uh, the problem it just makes the kid push yeah push away from right it. well when I was younger I remember I would have sort of calculated days that I would say okay today's the day I need to show a little bit of a little bit of anger and you know, let them know how important it is to me when when I think now that I'm older, one of the best things that you can do is find those one or two people, maybe have a private conversation and say, Man, I am so disappointed right. in your performance today. You can you can do way better than that. Let's try again tomorrow, right? And and that gets the same point across in a more personal way without being uh, overly mean I guess so, right yeah right well let's talk about you mentioned your uh, wife is one of your feeders oh. and so you probably have uh, more exposure to your feeder program than the average person what is that relationship like <clears throat> I have to be very careful what I'm saying right now oh my gosh is that my wife yeah, she is right. actually coming this way so Perfect. Oh, she turned the corner okay we're okay, good now good. <laughs> so here are all the secrets no um, you know what it's one of those things that it being in the district for so long, I guess we've both been there for about 15 years, and we've had we've been lucky enough to maneuver into a position where I teach at the high school, and she's my primary feeder at the junior high, and I I absolutely love it. I think it's great. One of my favorite things is the ability to kind of know more about each child before they they come and visit me. So you can sit down with these kids in, in ninth grade at their audition or whatever. Uh, as they're moving up and say, you know, I heard this, heard this about you. Tell me if the story is true. And, right. You know, their face turns red because yeah. we all do stupid stuff <laughs> oh, in yeah. middle school. And Absolutely. It's it's really neat. And then right off the bat, you know, that they they know I'm invested and that that I know about them, and we have that connection already through through my wife. So. Well, and it's always so funny because we we don't think about this as for our kids sometimes, but it's just like us. If you go see one of your idols or somebody that's important in your life. Uh, and they know who you are, you're like, oh my gosh, they know who I am. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah, my wife is actually um, the math teacher at our school. And so I get to know some of her kids that aren't in the program. She's always like, well, do you have so-and-so? Okay, well, this is kind of interesting here, and there's a problem with this, and what should I do here? And we kind of talk about that sometimes. Um, so it's interesting. Uh, in in y'all's relationship, I'm kind of jealous about that because you can really – well, utilize that information as you go forward. That's right. There are times, of course, that you're like, okay, you just got to come home, decompress, and if we cannot talk about music <laughs> or anything like that, it'd be super wonderful. But, but luckily, we have three kids at home to sort of keep us busy, which helps. But, but there is a tendency, definitely, to to over talk the the situation. But it's also wonderful because you have someone that understands and can very clearly connect with you and and know what you're going what you're going through and the good times and the bad times too so, yeah well and let me just ask you uh just a general question you said you have four maybe five feeders right right uh, yeah so what's one of your favorite events that you like to do with the middle school to get them involved with what they're going to be right. doing in the yeah. future well one of the things i remember back to the opening of our school and and i love looking back on i I guess in the moment it was it was great it was fine it was part of my job but now that we're really large school it is I regret the the fact that I'm not able to to get over there and see and meet those kids and kind of stand behind them and you know give them tips and, and stuff like that and maybe teach a sectional here and there but because um, that's that's a really wonderful time and I think those kids that came up during that time I you know I've known them for seven years of their life and now they're headed off to college and we have that connection that they'll never forget so um, ask me the question one more time and we get to the heart of it again yeah what, what do you uh, what, what do you feel like one of your most impactful or most uh, enjoyable 
uh, events that you do with your middle school. Okay. Feeding so, the high school. in October, and I think this is a tradition that that just started in Katy with other programs. And when I was a young teacher, I saw it and I was like, "Oh, this is really cool." Um, so I, we decided to sort of keep it going with our programs and especially our feeders so in October we do like the the masquerade serenade you know and a masquerade serenade is a concert and it's actually the first concert for junior high kids uh, that have been playing that are a part of orchestras Uh, the second concert for the high school kids so it's um, usually a collaborative environment where we have maybe a couple orchestras combined in every case, so the junior high, there happened to be a lot of orchestras there too, so they, she may have two of her orchestras combined, or if we have uh, more than one more than one feeder there, they uh, we make an effort to sort of combine uh, their groups as well, which can be a really a cool thing, because they meet each other at the junior high level, and then as they progress and get to high school, oh yeah, I remember you from Masquerade Serenade two or three years ago. And, um, it's a, just a really fun environment. I think there may be some directors out there that, that say, okay, well, we really want to start the year with the first concert of the year being costumes and chaos and not really holding down you know, order or having the, the highest quality musical product ever. And in my mind, I think it's a really important thing and, and builds community. And, other people see that as well, and it gives you a chance to communicate and work with your feeders. It's almost like a forced communication that you, okay, I know you're busy, but you, you know you have to you have to make this time to make sure the event is successful. So, as the years have gone on, it really has grown into quite an epic thing. I think our our orchestra parents sit and they plan for weeks how to decorate the stage, and it's just one of those events that has taken a life. Of its own, if we ever said no, we're not doing it this year. I think there would be pitchforks and fires. Lot, yeah, and, a lot yeah. of problems. So. <laughs> but it's it's really fun. It's grown into a couple of concerts now. So we have like a part one, which is half of the orchestras, and an earlier performance time, and then part two, and a later performance time. And that way, sort of break up the the amount of time that the kids have to be there, and the parents always appreciate that. So yeah, of course. Well, as we wrap up here, is there any advice that you have for the young orchestra director? Maybe they're in their, starting their first job right now, or uh, they're going to be starting soon. Maybe they've been in it for a year. What is something that you wish that you knew when you started out in orchestra? Right. Well. Or started out in teaching in general. Coming out of college, I think you hear this a lot. Uh, maybe teachers, from college professors, you hear the ideal way to teach, and on all of these things and then when you get into the environment of teaching actually starting teaching you know oh it's a lot different than what you studied in in college which is true but but anything when you jump in for the first time is going to be different you have to learn how to adapt and be flexible which i think everyone appreciates your principals your your parents your students Uh, but i think for me the luckiest thing that, that just kind of happened naturally is I always ask a lot of questions I wanted to know okay what do you think is the best way to do this well what would you do in this situation and maybe ask a a veteran teacher about their philosophy on discipline and and just get some feedback just so these ideas are filling your head and and of course you make your own choices and decisions on handle how to handle things but it doesn't go without you know knowing all the ways in which you can handle it so it's always so hard even for me now that I feel like I need to ask questions more because sometimes especially now that I'm becoming I wouldn't say a veteran teacher but teaching for 10 years or so if I ask that question someone's gonna think why do they not know this already and then think that I'm <laughs> stupid or you know and so that's just a natural some some people just have that and so I think as a young teacher don't be afraid, just like you're saying, and, and go for it. And I always tell my student teachers this, uh, ask me why we do things, because sometimes it's going to be something like, okay, why do you do this corral? Well, sometimes I don't even know at this point. I had a reason a while ago, but I now I'm like, oh, and it actually helps me think I should be uh, going in and investigating in my own brain, you know what right. I mean? Right, yeah. Yeah, and do a lot of listening and know that you know, even after you've been teaching 10, 15, 
20 years, you still have things to learn, which is why we're all at a convention like this, so we can share ideas and right. get to know one another, and, right. and it, it's a wonderful thing. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on the program. Well, thanks for I having really me. really appreciate it. Yeah. So, Matt Porter from Tompkins High School Orchestra. Yeah. Hope to have you on again soon. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Beyond the Clef. For more great content, subscribe on our website at beyondthecleft.com. And be sure to follow us on YouTube, iTunes, SoundCloud, and Facebook.